Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the society for the opportunity to talk today, and um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about better living through electrons. Um, so radio frequency ablation, or radio frequency, is using alternating current to raise intracellular temperature in order to achieve vaporization or the combination of desiccation and protein coagulation. And uh, this was first described by a, um, a, a man by the name of William Bovey, and I'm sure you guys all know about the Bovey. Um, and he was a physicist. And um, t a, a mere two years later, Harvey, C Harvey Cushing was the first to uh, utilize this in surgery. And, it, and over to the right, you can see the original patent drawings of the uh, Bovey device. So what I'm going to talk to you today, uh, this will be uh, brief and we'll certainly get back on time. Um, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about arm surgery, which is an endoscopic approach to prevent reflux. I'm going to talk to you about endostim, uh, radiofrequency ablation using strata, and then the resection and plication uh, approach. Some generalizations about this is that, you know, this is, these are really therapies that are directed um, only at the internal sphincter. And as you know, the uh, lower esophageal sphincter is a combination of the curl diaphragm and the lower esophageal sphincter. And those two units need to be opposed. They need to be adjacent to each other so they can work as a single unit. These therapies only really address the defective lower esophageal sphincter, if that. And we'll get into that in a second. Um, and their use is pretty much limited to those that have normal anatomy. That is to say, if you have a derangement at the hiatus with a large hiatal hernia or parasophageal hernia, certainly these wouldn't be appropriate therapies. This is all uh, an attempt, really, to expand and individualize treatments for GERD along the spectrum of the disease severity. Uh, we need more arrows in our quiver, and that's really what we've been talking about over the last 10 years. And, and um, much to our chagrin, a lot of the endoscopic uh, uh, therapies did fail, um, but I think it set the stage for a way of thinking that this is truly an anatomic disease and one that needs an anatomic cure, however that's delivered. And uh, this was also driven by a high disease prevalence and the inadequacy of existing therapies. So let's talk about anti-reflux mucosectomy. What is it? Well, uh, as you guys all know, Nissen fundoplication was discovered serendipitously when a patient had a perforation of the distal esophagus, and Dr. Nissen wrapped it uh, to uh, create a buttress over the perforation, and the patient woke up and didn't have reflux anymore. Similarly, uh, this was uh, discovered in, this, in a patient that had high-grade dysplasia that was undergoing endoscopic resection, and they found that the patient's reflux symptoms resolved. Dr. Inoue then uh, had the aha moment and said that, uh, well, let's do this in 10 patients and see what we see. And he selected patients that didn't have a, slide, a sliding hiatal hernia. And two of these patients, he was trying to use combination therapy. That is, let's prevent reflux and get rid of their Barrett's. So he resected the Barrett's. And in this, there was two circumferential resections and eight 270-degree resections. And this is what it looks like here. You can see there's a Hill classification grade 3 valve and then a 270 uh, degree endoscopic resection down to the muscularis um, along the lesser curvature. And this is the heel, heel, healed product after two months. And you can see it's converted to a hill one with sort of a tight, you're essentially creating a stricture at the GE junction. This is a patient that had a circumferential resection at the cardia. And you can see that they have 10 year follow up in this particular patient. Um, but you can see that it looks like there's progression of the disease, in my opinion, uh, just looking at it, is there's a hiatal hernia here where there wasn't one here. And then in terms of clearance of the Barrett's, you can see that there's a nice clearance of that. Again, this is 10 patients, but you can see before and after arms, you can see there's an improvement in Demeester score, uh, an improvement in heartburn regurgitation across the top, and an improvement in hill classification. So, um, you know, again, yeah, there's not much data here, but you see that there is a proof of concept. Now, Mikey Jiki looked at this in, in the U.S., and this is the first publication. It's not out yet. It, it came out, uh, had a print here. Um, 19 patients uh, that he looked at with this approach, and um, 13 patients had symptomatic improvement. Three of them needed balloon dilatation, 
and um, three of the six required anti-reflux surgery. But again, this study did not have objective follow-up. Um, and you can see here that uh, there is an improvement in symptomatic recurrent based on, uh, symptomatic um, improvement based on validated questionnaires. You see a little blip here for the dysphagia. That's probably these three patients that uh, required uh, dilatation, but it ultimately resolved, and these are very acceptable dysphagia scores. So what about electrical stimulation, endostim? This applies electrical pulses to stimulate the lower esophageal sphincter, and the idea is, is that you're kind of um, causing the muscle to hypertrophy and prevent reflux. This is an implantable pulse generator with bipolar leads, which look like this, and they're implanted laparoscopically at the esophagogastric junction. And there's a wireless external programmer that you can set the frequency, you can set the amount of time that you're stimulating and the amount of time that was off. And so here's the body of literature regarding endostim, and you can see that there's proof of concept studies, two long-term published studies with follow-up to up to four years with 66, 66 patients, and these are OUS studies. There's a post-market registry study with 13 and 180 patients enrolled, and uh, there's the ongoing FDA trial. And you can see that what happened when, they, when, VK, Char when VK Sharma first looked at this, he saw that, um, that uh, there was no obstruction with dysphagia at the time of swallowing. And so that was sort of an aha moment, that if you stimulate, you can overcome it with receptive relaxation. And you can see here that when they looked at these initial studies, they saw that there was an improvement in Demeester score. Similarly, this is the two studies here, single center open trial and an international multi-center trial. And you can see that over time, there's an improvement in the pH over time. And again, symptomatic Im improvement, it looks like this helps with bipositional reflux. Um, so you can see here that the nocturnal regurgitation had been eliminated. Similarly, there's an improvement in, in, P, in uh, the PPI use. So uh, there's an FDA trial. I should let you know that this has been closed down. And the reasons for this aren't entirely clear because we haven't seen the data. But I don't think the, uh, the answer is a good one. These are the centers that uh, participated in that trial, including ours and uh, Dr. Bouvi. And this was a nice design. It was an implant with a, a double-blinded approach, treatment sham. Um, sham crossed over at six months, and then they followed the patients out. But we'll have a report for you that, on that soon. In terms of uh, Streta, this is energy that's delivered through, through a balloon catheter that has little needles that go into the muscularis propria. Uh, you, can give up to, you can give multiple applications. This is a low, low power. You're not burning things. You're just heating up the tissue. And the proposed mechanism of action is hypertrophy of the muscularis propria with a reduction in transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations, or um, it prevents unrolling the sphincter with gastric distension. And there's a huge body of literature on this uh, technology. It's been around for a long time, and we currently use it in our practice, and it does have an application, and we can hopefully talk about that. Uh, it has multiple applications, but uh, we can hopefully talk about that in the discussion period. So in this, in this uh, study here, uh, this is 10-year follow-up, and you can see that they had normalization of GERD HRQL in 72% of the patients. A greater than 50% reduction in PPI use occurred in 64% of the patients, and regression of Barrett's esophagus was observed in 85% of the patients. Now I take that with a pinch of salt, but um, I'm, uh, you know, this is a single institution. Uh, this is a group that has published a couple of long-term follow-ups, um, so you have to you have to kind of weigh that with what um, what the overall results are. Now let's let's look at the Strata versus Sham. In the, in the sham trials, and you can see that in this meta-analysis of four trials in 165 patients, there was no difference between Streta and sham in patients with GERD for the following outcomes, which include uh, pH, GERD HRQL, although it did approach significance, uh, mean LES pressure, and the ability to stop PPIs. So the, so the control data um, doesn't really show an advantage over sham. But if you, if you look out there in, 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 our, in our practice, 
uh, we have had great results with, with in highly selected patients, and that is patients that do not have a hiatal hernia. They have, they're, you know, they're uh, really the kind of the kind of maybe a little bit abnormal Demeester score, typical symptoms, and no um, derangement of their hiatus. Resection and plication. Uh, this is really just uh, resecting, doing an endoscopic resection, and then using an NDO plicator to, bring, to kind of bring all this stuff together to cinch up uh, the esophagogastric junction. And uh, this was performed in 10 patients with GERD that were refractory to PPIs. There was no adverse events. They followed them up to nine months. And you can look at the improvement in the GERD HRQL scores, although there's no objective data. So this is clearly very preliminary. But the idea is that if you ablate the mucosa and then you sew it together, you'll get good apposition and good healing. So based on this, uh, there's a need for GERD therapies across the spectrum of disease uh, severity. ARMS and resect and, and plicator investigational should be performed under a protocol, but may have promise. Um, uh, intermittent electrical stimulation is not available for use in the U.S. outside of the FDA trial. And um, I'm not sure where that's headed, so stay tuned. You probably hear something in the next couple of weeks. Um, Streta continues to fulfill a useful role in the endoscopic treatment of GERD, can be durable, reduces the need for PPIs, and improves symptoms. However, the objective resolution of GERD, as measured by our testing, is highly variable, and, and, and in those studies that I presented, uh, really don't show much of an improvement over sham. And patient selection is paramount when you're using this technology. Thanks for your uh, attention. <laughs>